uh, Tim is of course the CEO of World Vision uh, and he'll be talking tonight uh, about how aid works and what still remains to be achieved and whether Australia is a good global citizen uh, in the context of the Millennium Development Goals, climate change and, and food security. Uh, to, from my point of view, to put it into perspective, Australia is one of the richest countries in the world, living at the richest point, from a material point of view at least, by far the richest point in world history. So, uh, you know, while we in Australia can afford to do anything we want, we obviously can't afford to do everything we want. And Tim, of course, is going to talk tonight about one of the options in front of us, which is to be uh, more generous uh, for those around the world. So, uh, please join me in welcoming Tim and Stella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you take that, Mike. Oh, oh, you're... Oh, good. I'll, I'll <laughs> jump up at the end to help you field questions. Fine. Good. Well, apologies for uh, delaying you. I got caught on some Flinders Street traffic. It's delightful to see uh, so many of you here. I've decided I'm um, uh, a launcher of things. I launched the spirituality in the pub, and um, I think that's died out since. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping that politics in the pub uh, won't die out uh, quickly, but uh, uh, maybe the next one will be drinking in the pub, and that one certainly won't die out. Um, let me uh, say that uh, I grew up in a family where uh, we uh, basically debated politics and religion, uh, after church, after Sunday uh, lunch, long Sunday lunches, and uh, it's only later in life that I discovered people who said the thing that has kept our family together is we never talk about two topics, religion or politics. If that had been the case in our family, there would have been no conversation. <laughs> it was uh, always a passion. Uh, so uh, I'm very, very glad to be here and talking a little bit about uh, what it means to uh, engage with power. My working definition of politics is that it's simply about who has power and gets what they want, and who doesn't have power and therefore misses out. Um, now, there's much more sophisticated uh, uh, definitions of politics, but whether it's personal politics in the workplace, uh, maybe politics in the family, politics in church, politics in all sorts of environments, it seems to be about uh, that power equation. Who actually gets what they want and prevails and who misses out? Uh, of course, religion and politics is a very tricky mix, <coughs> and um, I say this because uh, religion is essentially about that which you believe is absolutely true. And therefore the convictions around those things can never be compromised. Uh, politics is essentially about compromise. Uh, and therefore you're always tailoring views and being pragmatic. And as John Howard reminded us uh, just last week, politics is about arithmetic. It's about numbers and compromise and deals. And so uh, my own journey just in producing this has always been this oscillation between how do you have something that you believe strongly, that you don't want to compromise, that you want to hold true to, and how does that engage with uh, politics, which essentially is about profound compromise. When do you get lost? in terms of that vision, those convictions, when have you stretched so far away from them that uh, you compromise everything. Which is an introduction to me saying that uh, one of uh, the deep disappointments for me in the AIDS debate, which I, I want to talk about, is uh, the Labor government, strong Labor convictions, pretty simple convictions, uh, it seems to me, that say, um, uh, labour exists particularly to help those who, through no fault of their own, need help. The National Disability Scheme is a classic example of that. AID fell into that capacity and that category through no fault of their own, just that they were born in the wrong place. They were thrown up, as I call it, in the wrong latitude of, uh, uh, drew the, drew the um, wrong ticket in the lottery of latitude, thrown up on the wrong latitude, through no fault of their own. And Labour, uh, when Kevin Rudd was opposition leader, 
made a promise that was very significant. It said Australia will commit to 0.5% of GNI by 2015. John Howard, in the election he lost to Kevin Rudd, refused to match that promise. Uh, Kevin Rudd certainly set a trajectory to keep that promise. And uh, Australian aid, along with British aid, were one of the few countries where we see aid increasing. There are countries that didn't need to increase it. The Norway, the Norwegians, the Dutch, the Scandinavians were always at 0.7. But when uh, Kevin Rudd made that promise, we are at about 0.331. And the John Howard had been as low as 0.25. So at least there was a timetable, a budget trajectory, uh, again, a sense that Australia was going to take its uh, role in the world seriously. If you're wondering about 0.7 and where that came from, um, back in the late 60s, uh, Hannon, a um, Canadian foreign minister, said, let's deal with absolute poverty by the West getting 1% of its largest in helping poor countries. 0.3 was to be private giving. 0.7 was to be government giving, adding to 1%. That's how these figures came into existence. Um, now, we've seen Australians, pretty generous, not quite a point three, but giving over a billion dollars a year to uh, uh, agencies like World Vision. But we've seen the Australian government way behind. And as I keep reminding um, those on the conservative side of politics, this isn't simply a left and a right issue, you know, bleeding heart and labour. Labor having a signature on this. Aid was at its highest under Robert Menzies. Aid was cut most savagely under Robert J. Bork. Bob cut it really massively. Uh, when you actually look at the politics of this, it hasn't been necessarily a left and right issue. It has been above politics saying, well, of course, we are blessed, we are rich, we need to do our bit. So that's just a little bit of an introduction to uh, why 8.7 why we uh, uh, have been way behind and uh, some of that bigger debate that we can talk about when um, Richard maybe questions me. So let me just pose four questions and very briefly address them. It's the first question is, does aid work? Uh, good aid certainly works. It's made a profound difference to the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people in developing countries. We know that uh, just two years ago, Infant mortality rates were 30,000 kids dying a day. Today it's down to 19,000 kids dying a day in two years. Thanks to focus with the Millennium Development Goals. Thanks to a bit of a kick on, not just from aid, but by the Bill Gates and the Warren Buffetts and others. Uh, Gates has a 50 50 challenge. He's been saying to the mega rich in America, you don't have to do what I'm doing, giving 99% of my away to those in absolute poverty, give 50% away. And there's been a remarkable response to the Gates challenge. But what we've seen is greater levels of uh, focus on vaccinations. This is the uh, main reason to reducing mortality. Uh, the Global Association for Vaccinations, Gavi, uh, has seen, thanks to aid money, Gates money, uh, extraordinary rollout of vaccinations. Pneumococcal disease is one of the biggest killers of kids and these vaccinations are saving lives. Likewise, we've seen very simple interventions, rehydration, treating diarrhea. Diarrhea with pneumococcal disease is one of the biggest killers of kids. We've treated malaria needs. Again, aid rolling this out after pneumococcal disease and diarrhea, malaria is the third biggest killer of kids. This is A, focusing on what age should do. Really, what age should do is say, how do we keep people alive, particularly before the age of five? The next question, which is particularly a question of aid and governments, is now that we've kept them alive, how do we give them an education? And the next question, which is less to do with aid, it's more to do with trade, is now that we've given them an education, how do we set the global trade rules so that they can have a job? 
aid isn't doing the whole job, but focuses on that question, how do you keep them alive? How do you ensure they get an education? And then the trade debate really is around that issue of how do you make sure there's a future for them. So while aid's not, a, not the only, maybe even the main mechanism for promoting development, reducing poverty, it's also technology, it's trade, it's investment, tourism, local enterprise. It also includes corporate social responsibility. Might I say on that one, um, great to see the front page of The Economist this week, I don't know if you saw it. Where did the 20 trillion go missing? 20 trillion in tax avoidance. We've known for a long time that for every dollar of aid, $10 flows out of poor countries. We've known that when you ask what are the most corrupt places in the world, it's not Congo and Zimbabwe, they're up there. It's the city of London. It's Switzerland. It's Belgium. There, those tax havens, many of the uh, most effective tax havens have postage stamps with the Queen's face on the stamp. They're parts of uh, the British, uh, what's the word we use? Extension. Uh, it's another word. Overseas territories is the word. Uh, where is the 20 trillion? Now, I think the whole US economy, Richard, you might know, is about 15, 16 trillion. Here's more than the whole US economy locked away in tax havens. So the G20, uh, Wayne Swan, very keen to get out of Canberra and get to Moscow, as we saw just at the end of last week, came up with some pretty powerful statements as they realised it wasn't just poor countries getting robbed, rich countries are getting robbed too. And uh, George Osborne, the uh, Treasurer, uh, the Chancellor of Great Britain, really amplifying what this Tory Prime Minister had said when they slashed and burned the British budget, very unlike Australia here, they didn't touch aid. They're at 0.5% already, the Brits, and they've legislated to go to 0.7 in the next two years, by 2015. Cameron said, we won't balance the books on the backs of the poor. I mean, how's that for leadership? A much greater budget deficit than Australia. George Osborne repeated those sentiments in Moscow about how proud we are, and Brits are proud, of what we are doing for the absolute, those in absolute poverty. But they also added, there's huge amounts of tax avoidance going on. In Zambia, and I've been there a number of times, 40% of kids in poverty, their uh, Associated British Foods that has a whole lot of companies that you know. But the sugar uh, refinery there uh, has made 123 million I think, in the last three or four years, not paid a cent in tax. 17.7 million lost to the Zambian economy. They could have put another 10,000 kids in school because of tax avoidance. In the Copper Belt uh, in Zambia, uh, the copper mines sign up all the accountants, pay them double what Zambian government can pay them, and funnily enough, you can't find accountants to work for the Zambian tax authority. The way this politics works to actually deprive all countries. Well, it's a way of saying A is not the only uh, thing in lifting people out of poverty, but good aid, along with other mechanisms. Aid the targets the poorest, the most marginalised communities in undeveloped regions of the countries does save lives, give hope and education, strengthen civil society. So my second question is, what is good aid? Good aid is focused on important outcomes. It saves lives in humanitarian emergencies. We've done estimates of POSAID, and uh, our estimates are that it saves about 220,000 lives over a three year period. Literally a linear uh, connection between aid and saving lives. When people say, oh, it's all wasted. No, there are life saving outcomes. Good aid focuses uh, on saving lives, not just in poverty, but in humanitarian emergencies. It focuses on improving health. And most importantly, good aid focuses on long-term sustainability. Our own World Vision model is only to stay in uh, areas we work for 15 years. To say at the beginning, you know, the money will stop. You know, we will leave. 
And therefore the community is on notice that the aim is to lift our whole community to sustainability. So we work across all sectors, water, housing, HIV, microfinance, uh, 200 million rolling capital in microfinance, uh, and celebrating its 10th anniversary. Most of the loans targeting women. We work in better agricultural yield. We work in disaster resilience, which is all about climate change and adaptation. We work in mitigation, uh, fuel efficient stoves. We're doing the biggest reforestation program in, in Africa, the Humboldt Project in Ethiopia. It's often difficult to work across all these areas. I envy single focused agencies who are fantastic. We just do medical intervention. We just build houses. You can build your 70 houses, show the pictures to your donors. Donors will say, fantastic, our money got there. It's simple and they do great work and I envy it. But you might have built 70 houses, but the water supply is still polluted, the HIV rate is still raging. You're not getting any better agricultural yield. Because we will leave in 15 years, we choose to work across all sectors so that there is an interconnection in lifting communities out of poverty. That's what the word sustainability means. It particularly means focusing on political skills and organising and good governance. When uh, aid agencies say we're not political, I smile to myself, we're not party political, we don't take sides, however we're highly political. When uh, you train communities if we're doing a health project to say who should be doing this health project, they'll always give you the same answer. Well, our government I guess. And tongue in cheek will say, well, oh, you don't need world vision then. And I say, hang on. We have no idea where the health budget went. Palaces, weapons, Swiss bank accounts. So our response is, as part of this 15 year project, and the health project might be in the first five years, agriculture and education in the second five years, but if you want us to do this health planning, you need to let us train you to know what was in the health budget. You need to let us train you to then be able to track the money, to have those skills. You need to let us train you to organise and put the assets back on the health minister and let him know that you know and this is not what citizenship's about. Why? Because when we leave, who's going to put medicines in the health clinic? If you haven't been able to organise around these skills also. So good aid goes beyond symptoms. It tackles long-term causes of poverty, empowering citizens, challenging entrenched attitudes, saying we are political. In India, it's political. We are implicitly challenging the caste system. We are implicitly political, challenging patriarchy, why men make the decisions, why girls shouldn't be pulled out of school because in lots of African countries, the father thinks she's only going to grow up and if she has an education, marry, be married off to some guy and make money for that guy's family. We don't benefit from that. Sadly, this is how many fathers think. So she can be pulled out and look after the goats the boys get the education. When we challenge that, we are being political. I would say you cannot deal with poverty without disturbing the status quo. You simply have to disturb some of that status quo. And that will open up, I'm sure, a range of questions around what right do we have to do that. One level our right is wherever we're working, we're a local organisation in India, it's 2,000 Indian stuff, it's there. Community. What for us is overseas programs here, yeah, for them are domestic programs. They're citizens, they're voters, they organise uh, around how they will serve power and ask questions of caste. Final two questions. First, next one is Is all aid good? No. Some resource transfers between countries are less effective, they're even harmful. Military aid. Now, uh, most of uh, because Military aid can't be counted as aid. Uh, Israel's aid from America is mainly military aid. Uh, it was counted once as overseas aid. It's about $4 billion a year. 
tired aid, as we call it, boomerang aid, which has to be spent in the donating countries, not good aid. Food aid, when it discourages through its dumping local communities who give up growing their harvests and wait for the next crisis and the World Food Programme to march in. That's bad aid. The final question, how effective have the Millennium Development Goals been? They weren't a radical idea. They mostly took the rate of improvement between 1965, you know, the Foreign Minister Pearman was talking about 1%, 0.3 privately, 0.7 government. It took those, that rate of improvement from then up to 1990 and extrapolated a trend through to 2015. The exception was goal two of the Eight Millennium Development Goals, which aimed for universal primary education. The Millennium Development Goals don't cover every aspect of human development or progress. They don't deal with human rights or with issues surrounding work and labour exploitation. What they do is focus on a particular set of human development goals, poverty, health, gender, education and environment. They are global targets, so they're not targets for individual countries and regions. So there are country by country targets that uh, have been extrapolated. But they have proved very useful as benchmarks and advocacy tools. Most usefully, they have contributed until the last couple of years to the increased aid volume. They have really helped aid targeting. They particularly help the accountability of governments. You know, governance is the real issue. The poorest countries, all the poorest countries, they were MDGs and ambitious target. And we know not all targets have been met in every country, but progress has been strong. Poverty reduction, gender parity in education has been very, very strong. We have reduced maternal mortality and infant mortality as I talked about, 30,000 kids dying under the age of 5 to 19,000 in a couple of years. So, we can say the best thing about a scorecard which says to the world, we're going to mark your homework on your promises and what you've done, though it is off target globally, means there's some accountability. And now the debate is around the 2015 targets. So how's Australia done here? Well, Australia has, under Rudd, started well. Australia has, and this has been a win for us, uh, under Malcolm Turnbull, committed to 0.5. Pretty funny story, actually. I know I'm being taken, but who cares? Um, <laughs> we, uh, we hit up Andrew Robb as soon as he became shadow foreign minister under uh, Malcolm Turnbull. We uh, said to Rob, why won't you commit? John Howard had to 0.5, make it bipartisan, Menzian tradition, left it above the ruck, this shouldn't be a left or right issue, you know the arguments. We were surprised, I asked a Channel 9 journalist, a friend in Canberra, put this question and he said, oh, it is bipartisan. And my journalist friend was pretty gobsmacked and he said, the Liberal Party is committed to 0.5. He said, oh yes, yes we are. We're pretty staggered by this. I then came on straight after this and congratulated Andrew Rob for his statement. He actually wasn't across his brief. I said to my journalist friend, find out Malcolm Turnbull. He was in Whoop Whoop. We uh, ran, ran the um, win TV journalist, being the partner for Channel 9. And the journalist was saying, I don't get this question. Why should I ask it? He said, mate, just ask this question. So we read out, Andrew Robb has uh, said uh, it's bipartisan on 0.5. Malcolm Turnbull looked pretty surprised and said, well, good, I've always thought it should be. <laughs> Suddenly we had bipartisanship. <laughs> the party of uh, great financial sound management had added about $3 billion to the budget, their budget, without even a discussion in the party room. <laughs> well, funnily enough, it's been kept that promise uh, until, sadly, um, the poor swan dumped the surplus and this timing distressed me. He decided to shift $375 million from overseas aid for onshore refugees. Now aid has been used once before for onshore refugees. John Howard used $57 million 
This is 375 million. Overseas aid is meant to be overseas. This one stroke of the pen meant that Australia is now the third largest country recipient of our own aid. Indonesia first, Papua New Guinea, now Australia. Get a load of that. Uh, under the ODA rules, which are a little bit unclear because some other countries have slipped it in, it's never really been used to confine refugees. In other countries, it's been used to sustain and nourish refugees. We're using it to confine them. Well, that gave the Libs the slip, and Julie Bishop said, well, we're still committed to 0 0.5, but since then, obviously slipped away, we can't put a timetable on it. So, what has been the great achievement, lifting a above bipartisanship, saying it's not left and right? It is very low, given Australia's 14th and OECD countries, you know, where in the middle of the pack when it comes to a generosity. Now we're slipping, spending it on ourselves. Uh, and two days after they've done this, which is pretty terrible, and Bob Carr basically got rolled in the cabinet on it, I know Bob fought for it. Swan abandons the surplus anyway. Uh, this has been noted around the world. I know Bill Gates, is, with our boss, has had a conversation to uh, some of our ministers about this, how terrible this is. We're only at 0 0.35 cents. We were promised to go to 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Take out the 375 billion. We slip back again. Budget deficit. We're not. It's not looking likely we're going to keep our promise. And the lips, who were by far some sort of off the hook. So, these are the times we're in. Britain under Tory leadership, being magnificent. We under a Labour government that said this is, you know, fundamental. They helped us get a Security Council seat that we were one of the few growing aid budgets. Now, slipping. And of course, we'll be trotted out all the old. Well, does it really work? Oh, it's so much money. Well, it's so much money. The world gives about 120 billion a year in aid. We spend uh, 200 billion a year on soft drink. We spend 400 billion a year in the world on weight loss. I don't see anyone running around and saying weight loss is not working. But let's, let's cut the money. <laughs> it's amazing what aid has done when you think it's so little. That's what is. That's what is amazing, and now we're still. So let me uh, finish there, and uh, maybe, do I throw that to you, Richard? Yeah, well. Are you going to interview me, or we're going to... Oh, no, I'm going to take a few questions from the audience, but uh, I'll, um, I'll go first. Um, Serena, uh, have we got the clipboards floating around? I think, so again, if, if, if you want to know about subsequent politics in the front, Shane, could you maybe just grab that and pass it around? Um, so I'll, I'll ask the first question to you, and it's one of politics. So, uh, I don't know if you saw Four Corners last night, but it was on the incredible expense of the joint strike fighter, the, the paper aeroplane, as they refer to it. Because for those who didn't see it, it doesn't exist yet. Um, but we're committed to it. We're, we're determined that it will solve our imaginary problems. And the, the check we're writing for it is, is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, Similarly, there is bipartisan consensus around Australia's need to buy 12 new submarines to replace the six we haven't used yet. Uh, it's a $50 billion investment. $50 billion, that's half, nearly half, a third, somewhere between the two, uh, of what you said the global aid budget is. So, why is it that we are so willing to take a laser focus to what in the Commonwealth budget is small gear of $300 million. $375 million is second decimal place mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yet $50 billion to build 12 new submarines, most people haven't even heard of it. So, I mean, it comes back to your initial point, you know, politics is the capacity to get what you want. There is no scrutiny of the cost of defence. I'm not saying we don't need a defence department at all, but you know, if you saw the joint strike fight at the Barkle, if you think about $50 billion in submarines, the $375 million that attracts so much attention, I'm not saying it's not enormously useful to the people we can give it to, 
but it's small bit mm -hmm. in, in the sense of a $1.3 thousand billion dollar a year economy mm -hmm. and public spending of around 350 400 billion a year. So how, how does defence mm -hmm. not put pressure on the budget and aid is what tips us into the deficit? You know, and you see um, all corners, um, I'm glad I didn't I could have uh, had a stroke. Um, the truth is that somewhere within our psychology, the fear button gets pushed rather than the hope and the, the change button. And we've seen this in climate change, we've seen this in a whole lot of, whole lot of debates. Um, I love um, <coughs> Costa Rica, <coughs> where World Vision is seriously considering pulling out. Why? Because Costa Rica looked around and said, no, seriously, who's going to attack us? So they abolished their defence force. We can think of pulling out because they've spent that dividend literally on health and education and the, and the things that you know matter. And no one's attacked them. <laughs> um, this uh, extraordinary madness in, in the old brain of fear and flight uh, that somehow politics reaches into and is completely irrational, certainly sub-rational. I simply don't care. And when then you think about poor old Aussie, if they buy a desk or two, uh, gets uh, done in the Daily Telegraph for you know waste. Defence. <laughs> Want to talk about waste? Column submarines, and strike force, and uh, you know there is a complete lack of equipment. Uh, that's just mind-boggling. So I, I can't answer your question. <laughs> Uh, question at the front. Yeah. Uh, hold on a second. We've, we've actually got a mic floating around. Thank you. Why don't we do better with our taxation arrangements? You see, for some of the wealthy families, where they request um, their wealth to the miss the next generation, so they're saving death duties and stuff every every generation. And, um, and there are a whole lot of other you know, tax tax loads, tax vacancies, as the the ability of wealthy people to buy residences and set off the interest on that against not the not only the rent they get from it, but from other income. So their income tax on their general income is less than it ought to be because they're exploiting this loose there. Uh, and there are other things that are on the tax system. Why isn't there effort in your yeah, I, I tried this argument actually when I was on Q&A about negative gearing and I went through a list of rorts that I had said are on the of the next generation and, uh, and Joe Hockey just slapped me down, Penny Wong who was on it didn't try and buy into it. answer is there's such now a political constituency around it that they are completely afraid to touch it. So we've got ourselves into a mess that you know, I want to talk about middle class subsidies to those who are rich. It's the rich. Well, yeah, it's the wealthy. Uh, so I don't I don't get that. And um, I'm, I'm all for having a tax debate. Uh, but maybe Richard, this is your area. If you want to want to have a spiel on this. Uh, look, uh, it's, a, it's a good question and I think for me it cuts to the point you were making earlier, Tim, and that is that uh, whether it's countries whether it's, it's companies not paying tax in, in the countries they should be paying tax in, in developing countries. And again, give Paul Corners another plug, they, uh, they looked at uh, East Timor and the way the gas companies were doing what you described in Zambia, just massive tax avoidance based on the inability of a small state you know, to invest in the administrative machinery required to audit and, and account for these things. So collecting tax is actually an expensive skilled exercise and in the developing world do we really want their best brains going into tax accounting? Uh, so, uh, so I guess um, for me I'm, I'm, I'm glad this issue has come up because again coming back to politics, if people in this room presumably think, well, aid is important, I'd like to see more money on, spent on that, and, uh, and Gonski reforms for education is important, I'd like to see money spent on that, and NDIS seems like a really great idea, I'd like to see more money spent on that. From my point of view, and a lot of work the Institute's done in recent years, there's only two choices. Either you collect more tax, or we fight amongst ourselves. Is it Gonski versus NDIS versus aid? Yeah. 
and that's called divide and conquer. It's, you know, you know, this is in the new trick. You, you either divide interest groups, progressive interest groups, and say you can squabble to see who's going to be the winner in this year's budget, or you grow the tax base. And you either grow the tax base by shutting down the loopholes uh, or enforcing what's there a lot better, or you know, doing a better job of introducing mining taxes. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but look, no, we, 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 should, we shouldn't debate it for too long. But uh, either a quick follow-up, or there's a few more hands at the back. Yeah. Or you can have a car race where you can pay teachers and nurses more suitable salary. Absolutely. Yeah, at the back. We'll, we'll try and get a mic to you. Hi, a comment and a question. Um, the Millennium Development Goal that always needs to get to the bottom is the one about ensuring the environment is sustainable. Far from not reaching that goal, we seem to be moving away from it. Um, and I just, I guess we've seen recently in the US a bit of a step change, I think, in the hurricane planning office a couple of weeks before the US election and opened up some political space for. Obama starts talking about climate change and prioritising climate change and talking about it as a real priority. And yet in Australia we've had situations in 2010 and 2011 where we've had two states underwater and three states on fire and we're still apathetic about this in this country. We still don't think we realise that we've lost half the world or let alone what it's going to do to the world. So I guess I'm just asking for a reflection on what needs to happen in Australia in order to get this conversation going and why are we doing more about this in the context of development, context of national priority, why are we still in the five percent mitigation target? Yeah, the, the um, tragedy you now that happened to be there at Copenhagen, which was really the question of proportion who owns the sky. And India and China saying, India, we've got one point six tons per head and China six tons, you in America and Australia twenty four tons, you've actually got to make the big sacrifices and us unwilling to move, them unwilling to be locked into a process or a collapse that changed the whole geopolitics around this. And uh, we saw then the, uh, the uh, mistake and the stumble of uh, Kevin Rudd who could have gone to a double resolution on this and locked it in and uh, done a deal with uh, Turnbull and since then, it's just been very effective in that post failure of Copenhagen for the merchants of doubt to chip away. Uh, basically, the same tactics they used with saying tobacco doesn't really kill. And we, we now know, you know the strategy just so a doubt because science always has some uncertainty. Uh, this just became a, a home run of doubt and a flood, and it continued. Uh, you can put it on the agenda, as Obama has, um, but you won't get it through Congress. What Obama's got, what we don't have, is an Environment Protection Authority, which actually can drive some real change by executive regulation. We don't even have that. That's, well, we've got a carbon tax now, so we've at least got something. But, um, you know, you probably will see an election won by Abbott if it's a landslide, and the Senate falls, we won't have a carbon tax either. And uh, so we're in a we're in a situation that's you know, pretty pretty dire, pretty mad, and like you, I find it extraordinary how fast this has moved. So pre Copenhagen, World Vision could talk openly about our adaptation, our mitigation, why food security and reforestation go together. Post it. If I have an issue with climate change, Andrew Bolt on his blog urging people cancel their child sponsorship with World Vision. I mean, the extraordinary Hunnish attitude uh, has been really terrifying. Um, so, um, I'm with you on this. I, I don't quite know the answer. Oh, I don't, I don't have the answer. If I attempt it, it will take way too long. Way too angry. Um, Adam, on the back. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess I've got a question about something we can talk about. Probably tangential the way all those people are speaking of, okay. um, and that's for businesses and the, the role that their businesses have to play in economies, um, developing countries. Um, and there's been a debate in Australia about guest workers and 457 visas and 
uh, you know, it's always a debate about taking local jobs. Um, and I'm just interested in your thoughts on the role of grievances, but also the role that developed countries can play in, um, I guess, this, this role of guest workers, but potentially also guest workers on projects where the projects wouldn't occur because of project costs, related costs, or whatever, and possibly um, engaging short term or medium term workers from other countries um, at say, wages lower than local wages to um, enable projects to occur that might not have otherwise occurred. It's not really a debate that happens much, and I think it is potentially politically sensitive given that, you know, four, five, seven pieces and guess what is it's uh, is, is political enough, let alone the suggestion that people might be working on lower wages. Look, the big picture is exactly what you said. Remittance and the small fund, they are incredibly important. But they function a bit like a cash bonus uh, or a, a, a child, you know, a, a, a primary and secondary school cash grant. So when they go from people working here home, they'll stimulate some investment and spending. But you still need structure and infrastructure and you still need a whole range of country good governance strategies make the most of it. So uh, the second point is that remittances uh, aren't just about finances, it's the skills of people who come even if it's temporary and go back home with a view that, well, this country actually has a free press and uh, the opposition members aren't locked up in prison uh, and uh, this transparency is what we need. So I, I'm doing a bit of work with some South Sudanese. The hope of South Sudan is people from Australia and America going back there. The governments, sadly, the US government in the world, terribly corrupt. It just employs the family members. And it's people who have been here in Australia and America and elsewhere going back and putting the asset on them. Uh, in addition to the remittances they've been sending back, that is the best hope of some good governance happening there. So uh, it is a minefield with uh, unions uh, saying, what about our jobs? It's certainly a minefield to have differential pay. But it's not a minefield to say remittances and skills transfer, uh, even if people are here for a temporary time. is ex an extraordinarily good development tool. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Oh, um, I was just interested in your or in World Vision's policy of pulling out of countries after 15 years. Uh, in, in Australian political terms, 15 years is more or less forever. Um, why, why do you think decision makers in developing countries would have a different sort of, uh, approach to that time horizon and think, oh, only 15 years, we better get our act together? Why, why can they see further in the now, decision makers can. <laughs> Look, I better qualify this. We don't pull out of countries, that is, we pull it out of communities or areas. So we run a program, a thing called an area development program, which is putting child sponsorship dollars together with government grants and in business grants we get. <coughs> and working in an area we have defined as a community called an ADP area development program. And it will be anything from 10,000 to 150,000 people in a series of villages in a valley, uh, uh, a discreet slum in an urban area. And we will often move on to another place in country. So it's not pulling out of the whole country. Yeah. Um, look, governance is really critical. What we call overseas aid in the countries we work, where we work is actually called social protection measures. And the new lens that's going to be really important for the post-2015 indicators is the inequality lens. So how can it be? In India, with one of the biggest middle classes in the world, with more millionaires than the population of Australia, has at the same time almost as many people in absolute poverty as the whole continent of Africa. So one nation with about 400 million in absolute poverty, and yet millionaires in a huge middle class. So here at a space program, and an aid program actually now in India. 
So here, the lens and the debate for the post-2015 MDGs is actually inequity, which interestingly catches America. You look at child protection and welfare rates in America, and then the level of Azerbaijan, the richest empire ever. <coughs> so the inequity argument is you know, the powerful argument to say, yeah, we all believe in free market forces. When free markets actually are producing, as the American Republicans talk about free markets, actually are producing far greater inequity, you have a political and philosophical problem that actually can lead, does lead to social disruption, which leads to an interference with free markets. So even if you start with a free market position, inequity suddenly is the big roadblock. And uh, when we talk about whether other governments are as good or bad as the Australian government, we know that the inequity question is in Brazil, in you know, India, in uh, and China are massive questions. Um, got time for a couple more questions. If it's all right with you, we'll just go a few extra minutes. There's one slide up the front. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on an initiative such as it's bigger than I can say. And um, if you think initiatives that seek to educate the public on the ethics of giving will have the potential to influence voting policy? Yeah, these things look fantastic for life, they can be saved. And um, the power of this ethical insight is simply this. None of us would walk past the child drown. But we have no, we, we commit no crime if we don't wade in even if I've got my new shoes on and my best pants, uh, I just choose to walk by. But ethically, it is so absolutely unequivocal that we have ethically failed if we don't go and save that child. So he says, if I can save a child that's remote from me, in Africa, Asia, through my giving, through what I do, through aid. Why is it any less ethical to say, I won't say that person? Why is proximity the determinant of ethics? That's not to be said. Which is really a state of universal um, rights, if they're indivisible and universal. Then the person who I can give to here, who's hungry and homeless because they're a fellow Australian, if I believe they're a fellow human under the Universal Declaration, Someone who's homeless and hungry in Sudan, Tanzania, and I can make a difference, has the same ethical pull. So Peter makes a, a powerful statement. Now, we can maybe calibrate it and say you learn ethics at home and other governments have responsibilities, but the point is about universal human rights. If we're serious about them, that it has an ethical pull on me. So I think that book's a fantastic book. So do you think it has the potential to change the current policy? Can that book change? Uh, yeah, do you, think, <laughs> do you think it is? Well, none of the books I've ever written have ever changed anything. <laughs> um, I, would, I, I would love to think so. I, I don't think people are primarily bad or primarily, but look, there's some primarily wonderfully good people, if we can name them, there's some really malevolent people. I think people are primarily I think they're indifferent. I think uh, if it affects them or them, well, you know, they get fired up. But um, that's generally what I think. So, you know, our job at World Vision, or it's an Oxfam or a CARE, is saying, is, is something you can make a difference for and it's in your power and have a go and stir people out of maybe indifference. Peter Singer's book's done that a little bit. I, I wouldn't want to overstate his reach. Before I take a question, and hearing you talk about that, Tim, it makes me think of a, a, a joke I came up with with one of my friends about an outrage trade instead. You know, there's, a, there's only so much outrage in society, and the job of politics is to aim that outrage at the right issue. It's, it might be aimed at asylum seekers, or it might be aimed at refugees. Yes. I, we get to define who it is, or it might be people in Africa, or it might be petrol prices. 
there's going to be so much outrage as citizens already has, and the skill of politics, either as advocates or as politicians, is you know to aim it because people, you know, especially happy middle class Australians, they are you know often apathetic about these things. But if you can, if you can be the one that taps their sense of outrage, you can drive big changes. Uh, question up the front. Yeah, just um, just. Uh, Assuming we do get a change of uh, government, yes, sounds likely, and that government does follow through on its you know, anti debt rhetoric. So we do see you know, fairly significant switching cuts across the board to, you know, to, to uh, for whatever reason, just make this, you know, this, this um, very debt reduction thing which is painfully crazy. Um, how does that get impact on? You know, your organisation, um, and, and I guess this is a broader comment of how you see the impact on social policy more generally. Yeah. Well, we're worried. Um, the, the truth is that we already give so little uh, that I have never seen the Australian public so grumpy, so polarised, when every other country in the world would love to have our problems. Uh, we have lost perspective and we're in a faux debate about how bad things are and how bad the economy is and how, you know, we've got 5.5% unemployment, which um, you're the economist is almost equal employment. Um, and every job loss, when we're in a major transition, an old job to old economy, different jobs, the sudden, suddenly prove that things are terrible and we're in a mess. So it affects giving, and uh, if uh, there are savage cuts, uh, as you saw in Queensland under um, Cam Campbell Newman, it affects confidence, that affects people's sense of private giving, it affects us dramatically, that affects the poor, who are our ultimate donor stakeholder, uh, so community stakeholder. So uh, we're facing all of this with a great deal of apprehension. How do you prick this bubble of um, extraordinary, um, uh, almost delusion of how bad things are? Um, I might uh, I might wrap things up with a with a quick story that I hope ties together uh, what Tim's been talking about about the incredible opportunity for those in the rich world to help those with far less. An issue of climate change came up before. I guess the premise of this is that once upon a time we hadn't heard of climate change and countries like Australia didn't set out to pollute, we just thought we were making energy. But we have known for quite some time now what we're doing. The debate we're having with China and India is well, what's a fair way forward? We put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, we can't all keep doing it. How are we going to share? How are we going to share the atmosphere? And my friend Andrew McIntosh uh, gave me the following little example. He said, imagine you're at a toddler's party. And I've got a five-year-old and two-year-old, so see what it is uh, You're at a toddler's party and, and you bring out the birthday cake and you put it in the corner and no one saw it come out except three little kids who ate it. <laughs> All of it. And there they sit, chocolate cake covering their face. I mean, luckily, Mum's well prepared and has had another cake. It's all right. Well, luckily, we've got this second cake. But we're going to have to talk about how to share the second cake. So we bring the second cake out, and one kid says, "Well, I didn't get any of that last." And there's ten kids at the party today. So I didn't get any of that last cake, so I think we should chop this one up seven ways. They've had their share. One of the other kids said, "Well, no one said they couldn't eat the cake." So I think we chop it up ten ways. And one of the little kids chopped it all over his face and says, well, I've grown accustomed to eating a lot of That is the Australian negotiating position on climate change. We are used to this. We grew rich doing this. I need three fridges. And my sacrifice is worse than your sacrifice because I know how good this could be. 
seriously, that is the negotiating position. So I think that you know we we do need well we obviously need uh, organisations like uh, World Vision and we need people like Tim, but we need stories about like we heard tonight that we can make a difference. I mean I learned a lot, but 120 billion dollars a year that's nothing. This is. See, it's the Australian economy, 1,300 billion a year. We're tiny. Ask a climate skeptic. We're tiny. What difference can Australia make? <laughs> well, our, our, our national income is 10 times world expenditure on aid. So, uh, so thank you, Tim. And not just for, for coming along tonight, but for, for being so uh, available to the Australian community and on behalf of the Australian Institute, you know, well done to World Vision for, for keeping these issues up there in what I think is going to be an interesting election year. Uh, certainly if the polls are ready to go by, we'll have, uh, we'll have a, at least we have a long time to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not too late. And again, $300 million a year with no insult intended to those of us on average income, is nothing. This is trivial. This is rounding error. And we need to understand, as I said at the beginning, that a country as rich as Australia can do anything we want. We just can't do everything we want. But we need politics to set our priorities. So uh, please join me in thanking Tim.